Malaria is one of the most deadly infections in human history. Even today, it infects over 200 million people every year, the vast majority in sub-Saharan Africa. Spread by the bite of the Anopheles mosquito, malaria is caused by five species of the parasite Plasmodium and induces a laundry list of horrible symptoms, including intense recurring fever, shivering, joint pain, liver damage, convulsions, and in over 400,000 cases every year, death. Given these terrible symptoms, it is difficult to imagine that anyone would willingly volunteer to be infected with malaria. Yet in the early 20th century, tens of thousands of people did precisely that. Known as pyrotherapy, or more commonly fever therapy, this bizarre practice was developed as a desperate treatment of last resort for a disease even more feared than malaria. And that was syphilis. The origins of syphilis are shrouded in mystery, long thought to have been brought back from the New World by sailors from Christopher Columbus's first voyage. Relatively new evidence suggests that the disease actually existed in Europe for thousands of years until crowded conditions in the 15th century European cities caused it to mutate into a more virulent form. But whatever its origins, it has been humanity's constant companion ever since, infecting millions of people including Leo Tolstoy, Friedrich Nietzsche, Al Capone, and Adolf Hitler. Caused by the spirochyte bacterium Treponema pallidum, syphilis is spread either through sexual intercourse or congenitally from mother to child and develops in three overlapping phases, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary syphilis, which sets in two to six weeks after infection, typically presents as painful sores or cankers at the site of infection, typically the genitals. This usually clears up within a few weeks and is followed around six months later by the onset of secondary syphilis. Secondary syphilis typically presents as a low-grade fever fever, headache, and disfiguring skin rashes, open legions, and warts, which can last anywhere between a few weeks and a few months. In two-thirds of cases, this is followed by a period of latency, which can last the rest of the patient's natural life. But in the remaining third, after a period of years or even decades, the disease can suddenly reappear in its most devastating form, tertiary or neurosyphilis. In this stage, the disease attacks the nervous system and the brain, inducing progressive paralysis, dementia, mania, and psychosis. Left untreated, tertiary syphilis inevitably leads to death within three to four years, and for much of human history, the only treatments were highly toxic mercury compounds, which were just as likely to kill the patient as cure them. Due to the long delay between infection and the onset, for quite some time the cause of neurosyphilis was unknown, and its symptoms were grouped into a general psychiatric syndrome known as general paresis of the insane or GPI. But this began to change in the 1880s thanks to an observant Austrian psychiatrist named Julius Wagner Jorek. Born on March 7, 1857, in Wels, Upper Austria, Julius Wagner Joreg never intended to work in psychiatry. After graduating in medicine in 1880, he applied to work as a general practitioner at Vienna's two teaching hospitals, but was turned down. With no other prospects, in 1883, he accepted a position at the University of Vienna's psychiatric clinic, a decision he later quipped, which harmed neither myself nor psychiatry. Yet despite his reluctance, Wagner Joreg proved a skilled and observant clinician. In 1889, he transferred to the neuropsychiatric clinic at the University of Graz, where he undertook his first groundbreaking study on cretinism, a congenital disorder producing both impaired physical and mental development. While studying peasants in rural Austria, Wagner Joreg discovered that cretinism was caused by a deficiency of iodine and recommended that the government distribute iodized salt to reduce its incidence. This policy was belatedly adopted in 1923 and is now a common practice around the world. Wagner Joreg's experience with cretinism started started him thinking about the possible organic causes of other psychiatric disorders. This was to prove fortuitous, for he soon began to note as a curious phenomenon in Austrian asylums. In 1888, epidemics of typhoid, malaria, smallpox, and scarlet fever raged through these institutions. Of those patients who survived, several found themselves miraculously cured of their original mental illness and were able to return to their normal lives. Intrigued, Wagner Jurek combed the literature and found 30 well-documented cases dating back to antiquity in which high fever had led to patients being cured of psychosis. In the 3rd century BCE, Hippocrates had written of the beneficial effects of malaria on epilepsy, while in the 2nd century CE, Roman physician Claudius Garland had described a case of melancholy cured by cortin, or malarial fever. 
In 1848, F. Koster of the University of Bonn reported seven cases of psychosis improved by bouts of malaria, while Wagner Jurek himself had observed two cases of mental illness cured by typhus and erysipelas, a type of streptococcus infection. He wrote up his findings in a paper titled The Effect of Feverish Diseases on Psychoses, and soon began to wonder whether artificially induced fever could be used as a treatment for mental illness. Wagner Jurek first tested his fever therapy hypothesis in 1887. To induce high-grade fever, he first tried infecting his patients with streptococcus bacteria, but when this had no effect in 1890, he switched to tuberculin, a protein extract used in the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Of the first batch of 69 patients treated, two experienced total remission. However, Wagner Jurek soon abandoned this method as it took too long to take effect. The clinic where he was working only kept patients a short time, preventing him from studying the long term effects. He presented his preliminary results in 1909 at the 16th International Medical Congress in Budapest, and while reaction to his methods was mixed, many declaring the deliberate infection of patients with dangerous diseases unethical, Wagner Jurek received the enthusiastic support of fellow psychiatrists. Psychiatrist Ernst Maher, who had himself successfully treated 20 paralyzed GPI patients using tuberculin. Medicine, it seemed, was on the verge of uncovering the first effective treatment for mental illness. Meanwhile, recent discoveries were revolutionizing the treatment of syphilis. In 1905, German researchers Fritz Schandin and Erich Hoffmann identified the bacterium Treponema pallidum as the causative agent of syphilis and general paresis of the insane, while the next year August von Wassermann developed the first blood test for reliably diagnosing the disease. In light of these revelations, Wagner Jurek realized that fever therapy was not in fact a general cure for mental illness, but a specific treatment for neurosyphilis. He also realized that the ideal agent for his treatment would be malaria, which not only reliably induced high-grade fever, but could also subsequently be cured using the drug quinine, which had been in use since the late 16th century. Wagner Jurek's chance to test his theory would not come until June the 14th, 1917, when a wounded soldier was admitted to the clinic suffering from malaria. Seizing this unique opportunity, Wagner Jurek drew a sample of the soldier's blood and used it to infect nine patients suffering from neurosyphilis. He waited until the patients had endured between seven and eleven attacks of fever before administering quinine and curing them of their malaria. The results were encouraging. Of the nine patients, one died and two showed no improvement, but the remaining six improved sufficiently to return to their original lives, though all but two eventually relapsed. Encouraged by these results, in 1919, Wagner Jurek launched into full clinical trials using Plasmodium Vivax, the least dangerous and most easily treatable malaria variant. By February 1921, of 150 patients treated with fever therapy, 12 recovered completely, while the end of that same year, 50 out of 200 patients have been cured. Despite initial reservations, fever therapy was gradually accepted around the world, and by 1923 had been adopted in the Netherlands, Britain, Italy, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, France, Russia, the United States, and several South American countries. Such was Doctor's enthusiasm for the new treatment that a 1923 editorial in the American Journal of Psychiatry predicted, it may be that every large hospital for mental disorders may have to maintain one or more malarial patients as sources of infectious material. Many variations on the technique were also developed. In the Soviet Union, the pyrogenic agent of choice was sulfosinum, a suspension of sulfur in olive oil, while elsewhere, doctors used gas or electrically heated fever cabinets to raise their patient's body temperature. In all cases, the treatment relied on treponema pallidum's extreme sensitivity to heat. If a patient's body temperature could be maintained above 39 degrees Celsius for long enough, then all the bacteria in their bloodstream would be destroyed. While the idea of deliberately infecting people with malaria might seem reckless and barbaric, barrack today, it is important to remember that in those days, neurosyphilis was virtually a guaranteed death sentence. Thus, for many, fever therapy was truly the lesser of two evils. Nonetheless, the treatment was not without its risks. Only 30% of patients were permanently cured, while 60% later relapsed, and between 2 and 20% died of malaria. In 1927, Julius Volta Jureg was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for his discovery of fever therapy. He had been recommended for the prize as early as 1924, but the then referee of the Nobel Committee, Swedish psychiatry professor B. Gadelius, refused to recommend a physician who injected malaria into a paralytic because he was, in his eyes, a criminal. A year after receiving his prize, Wagner Jureg retired from medicine at the age of 71. In the 1930s, he would become a staunch supporter of the Nazis and their policies of eugenics and racial purity, serving as the president of the Austrian League for Racial Regeneration and Heredity. However, his application to join the Austrian Nazi party was rejected because his first wife was Jewish. Julius Wagner Jureg died on September 27, 1940, at the age of 83. The heyday of his greatest discovery, however, would be short-lived. The year 1910 had seen the introduction of Salvasan, the first effective anti-syphilis 
catalytic drug and the first targeted synthetic drug in history. Salvasan was developed by German physician Paul Ehrlich, who, after noticing that certain synthetic dyes only stained some bacteria and not others, set out to create a so-called magic bullet that would kill bacteria while leaving the patient unharmed. Together with his assistant, Sahakiro Hatta, Ehrlich tried 606 different compounds before landing on an arsenic-based formula that proved devastatingly effective against syphilis. Hitting the market barely a year after its discovery, Salvasan was one of the world's first blockbuster drugs and pioneered an entire field that would soon become known as chemotherapy. But while revolutionary, Salvasan was not a perfect drug. Degrading quickly in air, it had to be kept in sealed vials and mixed by the physician immediately before injection. It was also extremely toxic and corrosive, and if improperly administered, could burn flesh and cause severe liver damage. Consequently, Salvasan and fever therapy were often used together to maximize the chance of success. However, the early 1940s saw the development of penicillin, the world's first universal antibiotic, and after the Second World War, the use of salvasan and fever therapy was all but abandoned. Today, syphilis is no longer the scourge it once was, being easily treatable with a variety of broad-spectrum antibiotics. Nonetheless, some 11 to 12 million adults and 1.5 million congenital cases are still reported every year, largely in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, where the disease is still endemic. While a brief and bizarre chapter in the history of medicine, fever therapy introduced new ideas as to the origins of mental illness and led to the development of more effective organic treatments such as electroconvulsive or shock therapy still used today in cases of severe depression and bipolar disorder. The rapid adoption of fever therapy also demonstrates how far doctors were willing to go in their struggle against previously incurable diseases, especially those as feared and stigmatized as syphilis. And now for a bonus fact. While we tend to think of malaria as a uniquely tropical disease, it was in fact endemic to parts of Europe and North America for centuries until the draining of marshes and other mosquito abatement measures led to its eventual eradication. Three U.S. presidents, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt, are known to have contracted malaria while English Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell died of the disease on September 3, 1658. Cromwell had been offered the drug quinine, which had been brought back from South America by Jesuit missionaries in the 1570s, but being a staunch Puritan, refused to have anything to do with a Jesuit cure, and he died as a result. But the most infamous malarial hotspot in Europe was the Pontine Marshes south of Rome, with regular outbreaks being recorded until as early as the 1st century CE. These outbreaks were finally brought under control in the 1930s when fascist dictator Benito Mussolini undertook a massive reclamation project which erected a system of dikes and drained much of the wetlands. In 1943, after Italy switched sides in the Second World War, retreating German troops destroyed the dikes and reflooded the marshes, causing a massive malaria outbreak that killed thousands of Italian civilians. Though all but forgotten today, it is one of the largest and deadliest uses of biological warfare in military history. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.